Welcome to this lesson where we will start describing and analyzing gradually varied flows. This model is an extension of the uniform flow model where we will relax some of the restrictive assumptions. As a reminder, a uniform flow was defined as a flow in which all the variables are constant in space and time, so a constant water depth and a constant velocity. In the model of gradually varied flow, the flow is still steady, which means that there is no time variation of the flow variables and that the discharge is constant in space and time. For the other flow variables, we will consider that the water depth and hence the weighted area, the weighted perimeter and the cross-section average velocity change from one section to the other. As a consequence, the energy grade line, the water surface and the bed are no longer parallel. The flow is said to be gradually varied because we will only consider progressive variations of the flow variables. What are the assumptions for our gradually varied flow? First, we consider a parallel flow. This might appear as contradictory with the fact that we just said that the bed slope, the water surface, and the energy grade line are no longer parallel. However, as the evolution of the flow variables is progressive, we can still consider the flow as parallel. Remember, this assumption is important as it allows to consider that the pressure distribution in the flow is hydrostatic. This assumption is valid provided that the curvature of the bed remains limited. We can see on the example on the left side here that in the case of a significant convex curvature, the flow tends to detach from the bottom line because of centrifugal forces, which induces a local depression and thus a pressure distribution that is lower than the hydrostatic distribution. On the opposite, as we can see on the right hand side, a significant concave curvature will induce an overpressure and the flow is compressed by the change in direction imposed by the bottom line. The pressure distribution thus shows larger values compared to the hydrostatic distribution. In a gradually varied flow, we can define three different slopes bed slope S0, the free surface slope SW, and the energy grade line slope SF that represents the head losses per unit length. We also know that for a uniform flow, S0 equal SW equal SF, in such a way that it is possible to write this equation here either with S0 or with SF. In gradually varied flows, we will assume that the local energy grade line slope SF is equal to that of an equivalent uniform flow with the same water depth and velocity in the considered cross section. Let us explain this assumption. So we consider the illustrated flow with the bed slope S0 here. We can calculate the uniform flow depth corresponding to this bed slope with equation 1 here, and we find the red line that is parallel to the bed. In the equation, AU and RU represent the wetted area and the hydraulic radius respectively, corresponding to the uniform depth HU for the discharge Q. If the actual water surface profile in this channel is the blue line here with a depth H at section A that is larger than HU, we can calculate the head losses per unit length SF using equation 2. Doing this consists in fact in assuming that the head loss at section A are equal to the head losses that would be observed for a uniform flow with a depth equal to H. The corresponding energy grade line is the green line SF parallel to a fictitious bed slope S0 prime 
and corresponding to a fictitious uniform flow depth h. Combining equations 1 and 2, we can write the ratio here in equation 3, in which a is of course larger than au and r is larger than ru. So as a result, sf is smaller than s0. This means that the fictitious uniform flow with the depth h corresponds to a bed slope s0 prime that is smaller than the actual bed slope s0. So the head losses for the flow with the depth h are smaller than the head losses for a uniform flow with the same depth. In the same way, we can consider the case when h here is smaller than hu. So we have here the uniform flow corresponding to the bed slope S0 and the actual water profile here in blue. From the ratio in equation 3, we can deduce that now SF is larger than S0, which means that the flow will slow down as the braking forces due to friction are larger than the gravity driving forces. We see that in the first case here on the left, when h is larger than hu, the flow will accelerate. It will reduce its depth and thus progressively tend to the uniform flow given by the red line. In the second case here, when h is smaller than hu, the water depth will progressively increase and tend towards the red line corresponding to the uniform flow. This explains why the uniform flow is considered as the natural flow or normal flow, because on average, the energy loss expressed by SF must be equal to the energy brought by the bed slope expressed by S0. Therefore, the flow depth corresponding to the uniform flow is referred to as the normal depth. It is a depth of the normal or most natural flow. Finally, we also assume a small bed slope S0 and consider that the channel is prismatic. And now that we have detailed the assumptions, we can introduce another important concept, the specific energy. The specific energy in a cross-section is defined as the average energy per unit weight of liquid with respect to the local bed elevation. So it can be considered as the average head in the cross-section defined with respect to a specific reference plane. Using the definition of the bed slope S0 that is recalled here, we can also write the specific energy like this. It corresponds, in fact, to the vertical distance between the bed and the energy grade line in a given section, in such a way that we actually have a relation like this one between the key variables. Indeed, the other parameters are known or can be deduced from the flow variables. The wetted area A is a direct function of the depth H, S0 is fixed for a given channel, and alpha is usually considered as constant, often close to 1. The definition of the specific energy in equation 1 can be rewritten um, like here in equation 2, showing that the discharge is equal to 0 for these two values of the depth. So in a HQ plot, this corresponds to the two red points which indicates that the curve between these two points should present a maximum discharge for a certain depth. To find the depth corresponding to the maximum discharge, we take the derivative of equation 2 with respect to the depth h. In equation 3, as we see after evaluating the derivative, we need to evaluate also dA dh. This can be done by looking at the sketch of a cross-section. For a small increase in depth dh, the corresponding increase in area dA 
can be approximated at the first order as LDH. So we can replace DADH here in equation 3 by L and obtain equation 4 from which we deduce the relation giving the depth of the maximum discharge for a given specific energy E. The depth of the maximum discharge is called the critical depth and is denoted HC. So for a given specific energy, HC is the most efficient depth, that is the depth that maximizes the discharge in the channel. The relation highlighted in blue here, issued from the definition of the specific energy, gives the blue curve in the graph. We can see that for a given discharge Q1 lower than Qmax, there are two possible flow depths, one below, one below Hc and one above Hc. We can also conclude that for a fixed level of specific energy, it is impossible to have a discharge larger than Qmax. From equation 1, we can also represent the specific energy as a function of the water depth for a given discharge Q. The curve representing this equation has two asymptotes. First, the vertical axis of the ordinates when H uh, approaches zero. Indeed, if H approaches zero, A tends to zero and the specific energy E tends uh, to infinity here. Then, if H approaches infinity, E will also tend to infinity. Indeed, as A will tend to infinity, this term here in equation 1 will disappear and it remains only H. So, if we represent E divided by the square root of 1 minus S0 square in the ordinates here, the asymptote is the identity straight line. The curve between these two limits is the blue curve corresponding to this equation. We can see that for any point of this curve, the part below the straight line is the depth H, and the part above it represents the kinetic energy V square over 2G. And as we can see, this curve presents a minimum that can be found again by taking the derivative of equation 1 as follows. If we remember that DADH is equal to L, then we find again the expression giving the critical depth. This depth is as also the depth requiring the minimum specific energy for a given discharge. We see also that there are two possible water depths for a given level of specific energy here. The first one, represented by point A, is below Hc. We see that the water depth is very small and that the velocity is large, as V square over 2G is large. The second one is represented by point B, with a large water depth but a small velocity. So, in this lesson, we have discovered the concept of specific energy. From there, we have introduced the critical depth, that is the depth providing the maximum discharge for a given specific energy, or the depth that minimizes the specific energy for a given discharge. So, this depth represents a, a kind of most efficient flow by contrast with the normal depth of the uniform flow that represents an equilibrium situation. These two important depths will be discussed further in the next lessons. Goodbye!